This is the second half of a conversation that we started last week. I agree wholeheartedly in the instrumental value, rather the intrinsic value of what mm -hmm. we're talking about. But there, some people believe that that advancements in technology are are just evil, or that that the human race is going in a negative direction. That social media is corrupting the youth of our generation and then there's mind control and et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. And um, I just like, I mean, I have kids, teenagers that are glued to their devices and I feel guilty for, you know, letting them mm -hmm. do it more than they should. And uh, what, you know, I guess the reason I bring this up is some people think technology is is evil mm -hmm. and that it will lead only to the worsening of human interactions or human relationships. And I just, I didn't know if you were in that camp or not. Yeah, I, th I think if, if you look at the way I practically respond, it kind of looks that way. Um, you know, but I, like I said, I use computers at work. I mean, if there's a techno technological issue, most people, I actually grew up in a time where most people didn't have computers. I was probably a pretty early adopter of computers. Um, what Part of my ability to handle all the stuff is that I had to learn how to use it before a lot of people had it. So I had the ability, I, I wrestled with issues of, you know, quite honestly, most of the, what, it, we use the internet widely today. Oh, there are some good things that it was used for, but early on it was used to transfer pornographic files. You know, so it's it's a technology that allows things, um, but it's also, it, it, so it allows good things, but there's also a downside to it. Um, just as a practical measure, what I find is that the things I need to live well each day don't include a lot of technology. Um, you know, I've, I, 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 it's not that I'm worried about it or that I think it's bad. It's like I don't want to exert the, eff the, the extra effort to learn how to use it well, so I'm going to stick with the things that I enjoy. It's not worth my time. I mean, yeah, and, and this may strike you as odd, but I've had people ask, you know, wouldn't it be great to win the lottery? Initially, yeah. Then the realization, you know what? Now I've got to figure, I have to mature so that I can deal with having a bunch of money. The additional stress in your yeah. life. Well, and a lot of how I do things well is I don't have access to. So I don't have to worry about things because I don't have access. Now, I would have access to all those things. And I would love to say I'm strong, but I found that as I've gotten more access, as I've grown older, I realized things that I thought I was more mature were really related to the fact I didn't have access, not that I was really that strong. That actually <laughs> brings up a perfect analogy from, from my world. So if Star Wars. Okay. Right? So that's, uh, I was seven years old when I saw Star Wars in the theater, the original, and my life changed. That was okay. the day. That was the day. <laughs> seven years old, I knew exactly what I was going to do with my life. I'm not kidding. Um, it was it was my it was the call the, my calling. Uh, it took me a while to get around to actually <laughs> starting doing that. But uh, All right. the story, uh, if you read any of the behind the scenes of what it took to get Star Wars made, one of the things that uh, stood out to me is the limits in technology. Okay, that, you know, Lucas and any any writer, you've got a vision, something you see. On, I mean, you write it on paper, but you're seeing it in your mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, conveying that, you know, transposing that from written form when all the people that have to work together to get that that frame of right. what, what you're trying to communicate there. And so Star Wars is this hugely ambitious, you know, again, space western mm -hmm. with all of these, you know, different ships and locations and, and uh, alien life forms and all that. And so Lucas was constrained. Right. As you're talking about, your budget, you're constrained. And so George Lucas was constrained. This is a hugely ambitious and everybody thought it was going to fail. And somehow mm -hmm. he got, it was like $30 million, I think, that at the time was a big budget, but right. still constrained. And, and you, and compare that movie that first movie before the you know digital remasterings and all of that to the first in the next series mm -hmm. so he did three in a row right and then did th you know 
decade and a half, two decades later, he does three more right. where he is not constrained. So compare uh, Star Wars A New Hope to Star Wars The Phantom Menace. Mm -hmm. um, are you, have you seen? Yep. Oh, yeah. I've seen them all pretty well aware of all of them. So. so which one is a better story or which one is a better movie? You can't ask me that because I'm the scientist who remembers. I, I actually grew up watching the Star Wars come out in order. The most compelling story so is saying, A New Hope and you're Return telling of the your, Jedi. You're telling your, you're telling your bias. <laughs> you, you don't think you can be objective in this. I think it is objectively the first one. Anybody who's even a Star Wars fan will say, those next three were trash. So here's George Lucas with all of the money in the world by that mm -hmm. time, digital technology at its cutting edge at that time, and able to put on screen what his vision was, actually destroyed the franchise, like mm -hmm. uh, arguably. It, it, and so uh, what you were saying about not having access to everything you think you want makes you a better person or, mm -hmm. or helps you to produce a better, you're, you're forced by your constraints. And I think it's those constraints that, that bring out aspects that you didn't know were, were going to be better mm -hmm. than what you thought, if right. that makes sense at all. Lucas's film, and, and there's, there, are, there are studies that are done that between, when you watch a CGI movie that's completely CGI versus a movie that has mostly practical effects, mm -hmm. that it's more engrossing because it's more believable even though you know it's a movie or whatever, because the yeah. CGI is just this fantasy world and it's not, a, oh, they created that. You're, you're like, oh, that's interesting what they created. We're over here. You're like, those people are really there mm -hmm. in the environment. And so- well, is that something, so, you know, we've got Universal Studios and Magic Mountain. So one's actual roller coasters and one's simulated roller coasters. I actually find when I go to Universal Studios, I get headaches. Interesting. Because, and it's kind of related to that, whereas at the actual roller coasters, and you know, I'm getting old enough that I get headaches going on the roller coasters now, but uh, I love the roller coasters. They're simulating that, which is effectively what the CGI is. Mm -hmm. Is I wonder if there's something about our minds that the, the visual dissonance of the CGI amplifies the cognitive dissonance of this is not real. It's a different experience. Different experience, right? okay. and I th and, I, and there's a place for both of them. Mm -hmm. and I, I'm not saying that uh, CGI, I, I think obviously it's done very, very well, but sometimes it's done very, very poorly, and sometimes it's used un completely unnecessarily. Let, let me okay, use, all right. Let me use another example. So I, The Matrix was another, uh, another breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And I think the first Matrix used technology well, and then the next couple of them overused it. Okay. Right. And and it's it's really it's an art form. It's like where do you use the the, the newest technology, and where do you uh, where do you stick with the practical? And you know we're going our field, but this is mm -hmm. this is my area. Right. Uh, and. And here's another example. Let me just use this. Uh, there was a movie, a World War I film that came out last year, I think. Uh, it was called 1917. Mm -hmm. um, and that was particularly in interesting to me because it was a, uh, it's the era of the project I'm working on now. Okay. And so I got to see a high quality production mm -hmm. of the military uniforms of some of the trench warfare or some, or, you know, the warfare and the, theaters of, of battle, et cetera. And uh, it was just very, very well done. The production mm -hmm. values uh, were incredible. But they used a gimmick where the entire film was one shot. Right. So it was one camera following these two guys uh, through this mission they were on. Mm -hmm. And there were no cuts. And so right. a lot of it's obviously, you know, uh, there are cuts because... <laughs> you know they, you know, but with technology, you're able to stitch these scenes together. Right. But so it's an, the experience is you are just following them in real time. Right. Right. And 
so it's a gimmick which works for marketing, mm-hmm. right? There are, a lot of, right? there are other films that have done that, um, and this is a war one. Like uh, uh, Birdman was one that did it with uh, Michael Keaton as the as the star. Okay, and that was one of the first ones, at least that I'm aware of, that did it that it did it really well. Mm-hmm. And so this one, the advancements in technology, there are times when that gimmick serves the story. Mm-hmm. You're immersed, and you forget that it's one camera right. or one shot. And then there are times when it hurts the story. For example, there's a moment where uh, this one character dies and it's this emotional moment where the guy is like, you're my friend I want, and mm-hmm. there's no way to help you. And But 30 seconds later, he's joining a column uh, you know, of mm-hmm. artillery and infantry right. marching by within that span of 30 seconds, they didn't just appear in 30 seconds. You would have heard them. You said, medic, come help. Oh, you know, yeah, you would right. have heard them. And so it, it, it's like it pulls you out and realize, Got, oh, oh, interesting. Okay. So it's, it's the gimmick because they were slave to the gimmick rather than the storytelling. Yeah. And well, that, that, that raises an interesting qu- or question I would have for you is, um, how, how do you balance, because it seems like there are times where, or clearly if you don't have the resources, that forces you to be really creative about, you, you're focused on what are the central things, how am I doing that well, because you don't have the budget, whatever, you know, not just money, but you don't have the budget to do other stuff. So it really forces a lot of creativity. On the flip side of that, um, there are things you can't do because the technology isn't there. So if you've got the technology, now I can do. So it seems like there's, you can't just say, well, we're not going to have the technology. That'll force creativity because you'll miss. But if you develop the technology, that just seems to facilitate, at least at times, being a slave to the technology instead of doing the craft. How do you do that? It's an art form. <laughs> it's an art form. Well, I mean, I've, I've had the experience of where I... I mentioned, I think, in a previous episode, the idea for an unestablished, you know, uh, Hollywood screenwriter or filmmaker that you try and come up with this incredible concept that's low budget. And so Uh you are self-constraining in that regard. I've had a script that I thought I was writing for low budget and somebody said, you need to go in and take out, you know, certain things. And you go through it and I'm like, oh, yeah, and like having that location is definitely going to be more costly than putting this in another location. So mm, you go okay. through a script, you kind of comb through anything that you know. Oh, I wrote this scene. There's going to be all these people in the background. You got to pay all those people and you got to rent that location or whatever. And you're like, <laughs> right. oh, I could probably do this in another spot or whatever. Right. And so uh, those are all constraints that and it obviously depends on where you are in your career or whatever. But yeah. uh, but, you know, I didn't. I didn't like Endgame, you know, Avengers, the, the two last ones, mm-hmm. Endgame and the one before that. Like, it's like I sit through those and I fall asleep because they throw all this money at all this action and the kids love it. And I'm like, I'm not. It's like every one of these guys is the greatest hero and this every one of these villains is going to destroy the universe and it's all going to result where the good guys win and the universe is not destroyed. I know. It's like, now what? I just watched the color pixels fly across the screen. Like, interesting. Know, there's okay. something about a story where it's just two people in a room talking that can draw you in more than that. You know? And, right. And it's, and, and it's a matter of taste and, uh, we're kind of far afield. What, what, what's our topic? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about consciousness. Uh, or, or no, actually, no, we were talking about whether supercomputers could show various facts. You know, and, and uh, I, I, you know, I guess maybe this is me stretching for a connection in here, but uh, one of the things that as I'm watching movies, it seems like there are times where the movie's driven by, I've got to tell the compelling story. Um, and the fact that they've told a more compelling story actually diminishes the impact. And, and, and I, this is a place, and I, you know, I don't like down or bad talking, but it's like, remember the Titans. I love that movie. It's one of the few movies back for people who remember VCRs. We started watching it at 9 o'clock at night, got done at 11 o'clock. I actually rewound it and rewatched it. Mm-hmm. I was like, that's awesome. 
And part of what I loved about it, one, it's just a great story of racial reconciliation. But the I, I, I play football. I love watching football. The whole plot line of the football in there. And without giving any spoilers, their season didn't match in some very important ways. So when I went back, I, I just remember reading, it's like, wow, this is powerful. I mean, sports brought people together. It's just a compelling story. And then you go read what actually happened. And to me, the actual story was as more, if not more compelling than the one they told. Um, because, and and the, the only reason, or the main reason why is because I can't now go look at this and say, hey, and remember the Titans, remember where this happened. It's a plot device. It wasn't the truth. Forgive me. That's, I mean, for, I'm, forgive for Hollywood. I, I, I come from Hollywood and I'm saying, forgive us. <laughs> Forgive us, that's like, it's actually one of my uh, biggest pet peeves of late. Like in my short career in Hollywood, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's probably not even appropriate to call me a Hollywood guy. Okay. You know, I've worked multiple careers before I got my foot in the door. And I'm not some, you know, uh, elevated, credible mm -hmm. uh successful you know i won an award mm -hmm. so you know i will use that <laughs> i will use that award for whatever credibility it gets me but I, i'm a, i love stories and i mm -hmm. i love i'm a consumer of it right. myself but um the project i'm working on right now is is the opposite of what hollywood tends to do hmm. um uh, so hollywood there's a a trope i use that word a lot don't i or don't, uh, there's you a, might just define it now that we've used it a lot. I mean, I, I, if somebody asked me to define a trope, I kind of know what it means, but I couldn't define it for you. Dang, so. you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> it's a convention. It's like a cliche, right? Okay, right. It's like something that's used uh, to summarize uh, or, um, uh, for lack of a better explanation, it's a... I can't define it. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so it, it sounds, it's, it's kind of like it's a device to communicate something because everybody recognizes it, if you will. Yeah. Or is that? I'm probably going to edit this out. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. There are times <laughs> when I will edit. Everything else I will leave in. Uh, so there's a, uh, a common expression in Hollywood. Um, don't, don't let the truth or don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Hmm. And which sounds like what they believed they were doing mm -hmm. with Remember the Titans. Um, but the project I'm working on, which I've referenced before, um, it's essentially the story of Sogomon Tellerian, an Armenian kid uh, who assassinated the, ma the murderer of his entire nation. Mm -hmm. um, so there... In story structure, there are elements that have to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, one of a book that I reference is called uh, um, uh, "The Moral Premise," which is a screenwriting book. And, okay. You know, every screenwriter is going to have their stack of go-to mm -hmm. books, and this is one that was re referred to me, and I used it. I the first time I used the principles of the moral premise is in Blue Hope. Okay, I'm like I was reading that book while I was writing it, and I'm like, oh, let's you know, and 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 it's the script that. Mm -hmm. got, you know, it's like, oh, this is a good story. It's like, yeah. I will credit this book. Right. But it also got me uh, a, a mentor in a, a, a very successful Hollywood producer guy mm -hmm. who read it. And now anytime I need to have questions, I'll, I go to him. So, mm -hmm. so the, it's a proven formula. Right. Okay. It's not that this book came up with a formula. The book is, is essentially the guy who wrote it did a study of right. essentially pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. He was looking for patterns, and he studied the most successful films. He's like, what do they have in common? And it's this structure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a three-act structure where the middle act is, you know, it's four equal parts, and the middle act is twice as long as the first act and the third act, whatever. And this certain thing happens to the hero at the end of act one, and a certain thing that happens to the hero at the middle, and a certain thing happens at the end of act two, and, and it resolves this way. It's just this arc that the hero goes through. Right. In every successful film. Okay. And so when a screenwriter is writing a script, if those elements don't exist in the actual historical events, okay. they are going to inject them. Right. 
uh, makeup. You know, there's other devices or things that force them to change the facts, but mm-hmm. that's one that's the most common. It's gotcha. like, like if there wasn't a love interest, let's put a love interest in there. Mm-hmm. Or if there's too many characters, let's all boil it down to one. Or but, but, and if this event didn't happen at this guy's point in in his life, this main character, then let's create something that did or whatever. Right. This project that I'm working on, and this is what I tend to spiritualize the, this particular project because mm-hmm. I firmly believe that God brought me to it. Right. That, that it's this story that's been buried under the surface of history for over 100 years, just over 100 years, that I come along a non-Armenian and I recognize it and I recognize how incredible it is, even though all Armenians know it's incredible. I right. Mean, except for the history is fading. So this the current right. generation, it's fading. I'll get to my point in a second. I have a point. <laughs> the point is that the closer I get to researching this historical event and this mm-hmm. character's actual account of it, all those elements that are in that book exist. Hmm. And not just do they exist, they they exist in the order they need to happen. Right. And and spaced. Right, okay. Because the timing is essential. If you're gonna pull somebody into a story. You have to let the the story unfold and breathe before this event happens. There ha- this, literally, if the movie is two hours long, it has to be this number of minutes. Before that <laughs> thing. It's it's kind of down to a, a yeah. science in that regard. Right. And the thing is, I wouldn't have recognized that pattern if I hadn't already read that book. Right. Okay. And already put it into practice. So mm-hmm. it's almost like God was preparing me to recognize that this guy's account of his own story mm-hmm. fits a pattern in nature for successful storytelling. Right. And the beautiful thing about it is the closer I got to the details, the more compelling it is. Mm-hmm. And so in Hollywood, maybe I'm answering your question or addressing your concern. Mm-hmm. In Hollywood, I think it's just assumed. It's it's become this negative thing that is at the top of all the studios. If you say history they like let that go in one ear and out the other and they think all right which parts of this story are we going to use and which parts are we going to make up because it's oh, almost an okay. arrogance all right it's like, like we know better mm-hmm. we, we we know better we'll we'll make the story work and they don't even care about the actual history mm-hmm. like you're saying you went and researched the actual history and there's some more interesting things that never came out and my mission if if my project's going to go is is let's try and stick closer to the facts of history because how are people going to learn history mm-hmm. unless they're going into a compelling film or story yeah people just aren't that interested in history unfortunately but if you can there's very very compelling stories in history and history is very important well kind of tying back you know we were we were talking about uh, you know is will Will a supercomputer ever determine the factuality of Jesus' resurrection? So it's you bringing us back. To well, it, <laughs> I thought that was it's both our to jobs, job, man. Thank um, you. But you know, you, you asked the question: Is is your data good or bad? Um, this, to me, strikes at one of the central things we ought to be about. So, so in our society today, uh, one of the things that I find frustrating is. There's a bunch of information out there. It's very hard to find good information. Um, it seems to me, and and especially as a Christian, it's important that I know correct information and that I propagate correct information. So if I were to go into Hollywood, I would struggle because what I want to tell the story that's true in a compelling way rather than tell a compelling story that may or may not be true. Um, you know, I see that thing, you, you know, but as a scientist, I wrestle with the same thing. I mean, there are, uh, you know, we're dealing with COVID and all these, there's so many sources of misinformation and really related to how we use our technology, yeah. our computers. Right. Facebook, social media, Twitter, Google, take all of those things, put them together. Their primary mechanism or primary goal is not truth. It's about making a profit, which yeah. is what is most businesses are supposed to do. Um, but as a Christian, I have to make sure I use those to make sure I get the truth. You know, and that's a, I find that a really challenging thing. That's what I love being able to talk to you because you're one of those people who know a field that I don't know 
So you can tell me, hey, this is what's going on in here. So now I know when I'm watching movies, there are things I can be aware of where, you know, and you've done that with me with the science. I, you come and I, it's like, well, I don't understand what's going on here. And it's like, I can bring that expertise. And I think as Christians, we, we need to find people around us who can do that and speak truth into what's going on so that we're communicating the truth and knowing what the facts are. Well, I mean, that's a brilliant tie in because I mean, that's, it gets right to the heart of my, my mission. Why do I want to tell this story? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, it, it grew out of, I was looking for a compelling story that helps humanity, right? Mm -hmm. Something, not just a money maker or a, a, you know, violence, action, sexuality, any of that. I'm like, I want, I want to, I'm so tired of the garbage that's cranked out in my okay. industry. All right. And it's like, I'm here for a reason. God's put me here. What is it? It's it's justice. It's morality. It's 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 to benefit humankind. And as a result of discovering this story, I'm realizing something that I should have known all along. God's the best storyteller. This yeah. is a historical event that happened. God caused it to happen. He's in control of history. And all I got to do is tell that story and people won't believe it's true. It's so incredible. Yeah. Well, that should be a pattern, and it should be incumbent upon us, our responsibility as storytellers, to not deceive people when mm -hmm. we're representing things as truth. You know, there's plenty yeah. of room for fiction as long as you're telling the spirit of truth. Right, yeah. But if you're giving, telling important stories, the, the most important elements all need to be accurate, especially when they glorify God like this story does. Anyway. Uh, why don't we wrap it up here? That sounds we went, good. <laughs> somehow we went far afield and came back. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you guys are all enjoying this. What do you think? I, I, part of why we did this is we enjoy talking. I, I mean, we've had at least a couple of these conversations before, and it's new even this time. So I, I've right. had fun. I'm, I'm hoping people have fun watching. So. So uh, what that means is share, uh, you know, the commercial, the ob obligatory, smash that like button or whatever the kids are saying these days, right? Share this video, subscribe, um, and we don't know what we're going to be talking about next time, so I can't do a throw, but uh, tune in. We're going to do this once a week.